We've told you a whole lot of stuff today about what's wrong. Yep. Now we're going to spend some time on some things you can do about it, something in particular. Beverly Ekman is an educator, an author, and a nationally known speaker with so many awards and honors, there's simply not enough time today to mention them all. She's the executive director of the National Education Consortium and has served as a speechwriter for such diverse organizations as the U.S. Department of Justice and the Voice of America. Her expertise, her passion, is in saving our children from mind engineering in the public classrooms. But she comes to us today with a very special purpose. Beverly has become a recognized expert on how to counter group manipulation tactics. In fact, she has a day-long seminar on the subject, and she's got a catalog back there, a, a manual back there that uh, will give you a lot of those details. Now, what you may ask, does group manipulation have to do with sustainable development? Well, I think we've probably already learned that today. It has everything to do with it. You see, one can't transform the United States of America away from liberty to totalitarianism without, with uh, using Robert's Rules of Orders. The game play today in almost every public meeting from local councils to congressional committee meetings is consensus. A professional facilitator is used to herd the group to a predetermined outcome. Consensus is their secret weapon, and Beverly knows how to mess it up. <laughs> Today, she joins us to give a quick one-hour overview of her tactics. Beverly Ekman. Thank you, Tom. Well, are you ready to fight after that last presentation? <laughs> How many of you have had the demoralizing experience of being labeled a troublemaker as soon as you question or raise an objection to a policy, regulation, proposal, or teaching method? Mm, quite a few of you, I see. Okay. <laughs> well, being seen as uncooperative is a no-no, as you've probably figured out. Sometimes you may even wind up in an out-and-out -out confrontation when all you meant to do was inject a different viewpoint. Unfortunately, most laypersons, and sometimes even legislators, don't realize they're dealing with well-trained provocateurs the minute they set foot in a room with folks who are chairing a meeting. These chairpersons may pretend to be just facilitators and moderators of a discussion, but they're not. To have your view heard and taken seriously, you must know first how to recognize psychological manipulation and work around it. You need to take the debate away from your adversary and argue the question on your terms, not on your opponent's terms. To do this requires that you master certain principles of argument and be able to apply them in a group setting and under pressure. For reasons you'll understand shortly, it's easier to control a group than a single individual. Now, that may seem strange, but it's actually the reason behind attempts to collectivize people, suppress their individuality, as per Michael Shaw's comment earlier on. Unethical facilitators, like the ones with an uh, ulterior motive, will try to maneuver you first into a group setting, and that's your first giveaway that you're dealing with a pro. Or as I'll be using the term here, a provocateur, a change agent, an agitator, but basically a provocateur. The group is used by this provocateur to help combat any potential adversary by isolating you, ridiculing you, ostracizing you, and finally overwhelming you. Attorneys, media commentators, and journalists are among the few who get the training that I'm going to give you. Most of us are caught up in the idea that there's always strength in numbers and that that's the best way to get through to an adversary via a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Both are true only if people are honestly debating the issue as equals, but it's not true if the debate is dishonest. If a provocateur can generate a mob mentality and get it to work for him, well, he has control of the agenda. And that's rule number two. Never let the other fellow 
conduct the agenda and control the agenda. And by the way, that's how your kids get caught up in all sorts of nastiness, from falling for the hype over trashy artists like Eminem to competing to look like hookers and pimps in school. The teacher, who nowadays functions as an agent of change before all else, deliberately heightens peer pressure so that it functions as a mob mentality. Once that occurs, ideas can be planted that, get, that go against 2,000 years of civilization. Both children and adults will accept them for no other reason than that it's fashionable. Of course, children are typically undiscerning and have no experience with hardcore manipulation tactics. Too many parents today have been convinced by experts that authoritarianism and uh, individualism are bad. After nearly 45 years of this nonsense, most of us are ill-equipped to stand up for our principles, much less teach our kids how to do so. We fear being censured and insulted. When we feel cornered, we may sound hysterical, raise our voices, and ensure our doom. The key to remember is that the provocateur gets the group to do the dirty work for him. The mob mentality is achieved by creating what is known in the vernacular of experts as a psychologically controlled environment. You will want to disrupt, or better yet, preempt the establishment of a psychologically controlled environment. Failing that, you will need to understand the strategies and techniques that a provocateur uses to assure the outcome he or she wants so that you can counter these techniques as you go and get others in the group to help you, whether they understand what you're doing or not. In other words, you have to beat the provocateur at his or her own game. So, the first principles you need to be clear about to mount an effective campaign that will neutralize the provocateur's consensus building strategies are, it's easier to control a group than to control a single individual. Never let the other fellow control the debate or agenda. And watch out for the psychologically controlled environment. These are the core principles of controlling a discussion. The rest of the principles we will take up may appear at first glance to apply only to physical wars. But they're key to any kind of battle, including psychological warfare. Let's examine some of the strategic principles from an ancient Chinese text, The Art of War, thought to have been written about 476 BC. This little book has received renewed attention since 9-11, but few recognize it as the principles of psych war. An army cannot be run according to the rules of etiquette. Those skilled in war subdue the enemy without battle. Deception and surprise are two key principles of battle. The enemy's leaders must be confused, if possible, driven insane. That's actually how he said it, Sun Tzu, way back in 476 BC. From just these four principles, you can see that demoralization of the enemy was a high priority even back then. Our opponents today, have used these four strategies against the populace with tremendous success. The first task, then, of professional agitation is to create the psychologically controlled environment. This makes it easier for one side to frame the debate and to keep the opposition, that's you, from doing so. A psychologically controlled environment provides a platform from which to operate and prevents people like you from injecting another viewpoint or worse yet, redirecting the discussion. The consensus generated from such a forum typically is taken to your legislators and presented as what the community really wants. This sets up a kind of mass neurosis because people like you know the consensus isn't true. Yet the lie is presented by reputable sources that are believed. This leads to a psychological condition known as cognitive dissonance, meaning an irreconcilable conflict has been set up. As people become uncomfortable, you see, they vacillate. They lose their frame of reference, become alienated. An alienated electorate, particularly if it's the backbone of a community, 
helps the provocateur because it effectively gets the primary resistance out of the way. Another take on this game, if you will, has been for the provocateur to whip dissenters into a teeth-clenching frenzy of anger until they become so outraged, enraged, and frustrated that they start lashing out in all directions, unfocused and in disarray. Understand that the counterculture activists, the folks we're dealing with, are not interested in any exchange of ideas. They aren't writing well-considered philosophical discourses to each other like the Founding Fathers did. They want to drive the opposition insane. In other words, cause them to act irrationally. You know, get so mad that we sputter over our words, slam the door, and just lose it, okay? So, the hypocritical way in which rules are applied to those with politically incorrect views and the disparity in your treatment by the press, all this is deliberately calculated to drive us crazy. As the frustration is turned up, eventually someone, somewhere, will go off the deep end. A bomb explodes at an abortion clinic. A survivalist holds up in some secluded area and starts shooting the trespassers. This thrills our adversaries no end, because then they can come along and say that all people who uh, oppose abortion or all people who want to be left alone are dangerous, which brings us back to the beginning. It's bad form to object. No wonder we're getting clobbered. Now, remember, this is a crash course. Professional agitators spend weeks, months, or years perfecting the techniques I'm going to show you. So if you have a manual already, I'll be skipping around in there because this is normally a five to eight hour course with self-test materials and advanced strategies for folks running for public office in there too. You'll need to go home, memorize the various principles we're gonna go over, get with somebody and practice, practice, practice the techniques I'll be explaining here. Throwing hardball tactics back in the face of a professional provocateur is risky business unless you have practiced. You may learn how to do it theoretically, but without practice, you're likely to uh, you know, modify the techniques just enough so that you botch them under pressure. Too much or too little emphasis on certain words, uh, a telling facial expression, sitting with each other during uh, a, a meeting, all of these things can give away your hand, which you don't want to do. So with these caveats in mind, let's just move along. One problem is that most of us don't think like direct marketing agents. You, we've heard about marketing packages. Well, that, that's the thing here. Our adversaries do think like direct marketing agents. We care about integrity. That is, the end doesn't always justify the means. The opposition doesn't. We worry that others might get hurt if we speak out. The education establishment, for example, doesn't give one hoot who gets hurt in the process. Whether it's magazines, billboards, brochures, newspaper columns, speeches, press conferences, grant proposals, psychological impact is paramount to our opposition. Not the facts, not anybody's precious principles, and certainly not right or wrong. If you've read my book, Cloning of the American Mind, you're somewhat familiar with rigged consensus building. But for those who aren't, a little background is in order. The dictionary definition of a consensus is group solidarity in sentiment and belief and or general agreement. Unanimity, on the other hand, is defined as collective opinion. Increasingly, people are hearing the term consensus when what our opponents want in reality is unanimity or uniform thinking. All consensus building is based upon one of the principles of the German philosopher Hegel uh, from 1770 to 1831. In plain English, this principle states that you could take one firm view and its opposite, combine them, and come up with a brand new viewpoint, which will be a synthesis of the two. This new viewpoint will be one that all parties supposedly will accept. So a consensus is generally or essentially a collective opinion that doesn't reflect anyone's opinion. Okay? When the collective good is viewed as superior to or more important than the individual good as per the socialist globalist view, then consensus no longer falls into the category of a compromise. 
Consensus is a stronger term because the pro and con viewpoints in the collectivist mindset no longer exist. The rightness or wrongness of the original viewpoints are not at issue. The point is to produce a new ideal, opinion, or value that will be universally supported, or at least appear to be supported by everyone, and that's the rub, appears to be. The purpose of the various consensus strategies is to preserve the illusion that there is lay or community participation in policy-related decision-making when in fact there isn't. That means something far different from working out a compromise. When a professional provocateur is trying to gain acceptance of, say, a gay lesbian club at your local high school, they know they have to at least pretend to involve the community in that decision and have something to that effect in writing when people complain to their legislators in Congress. The Delphi technique is just one unethical method of achieving consensus on controversial topics. A well-trained professional agitator is uh, deliberately escalating tensions all the time among group members, pitting one faction against the other to make one side appear ridiculous and the other side sensible. The setting or type of group in which the technique is used is immaterial. The logic behind its success is that most groups tend to share a particular knowledge base and display a finite set of identifiable characteristics. What the provocateur must do is locate those smaller factions within the larger group. Provocateurs often call themselves facilitators because that sounds neutral. But what these pros really do is work the group over and ensure a predetermined outcome, what they call a consensus. If the discussion is facilitated properly, all participants will emerge believing that the decision was reached was their own idea. Only later sometimes only an hour later, will they realize they've been duped. Donning his or her facilitator hat, the provocateur encourages each person in a group to express concerns about a program, project, or policy. She listens attentively, elicits input from group members, forms task forces, urges participants to make lists. And in going through all this talk and motions, she learns something about each member of the group. She's looking for each raised eyebrow. She's looking at your body language. The agitator facilitator is trained to identify the leaders, the loud mouths, the weak or non-committal members, and those who are apt to change ideas during uh, an argument, change their sides. The provocateur first will try to become an accepted member of your group then later will turn the factions of the group against its own members. Suddenly, the amiable facilitator will become devil's advocate. Using the divide and conquer principle, she pits one faction against the other, and those views that are not desired will suddenly appear ridiculous, unknowledgeable, inarticulate, or dogmatic. She def deftly augments tensions, deliberately escalates disagreements. If the stage was set properly during the list building phase, a well-trained provocateur will be able to really get most members of the group uh, right where they want them. Individuals in opposition to a desired policy will find themselves shut out. The Delphi technique works, folks. It's effective with parents, teachers, school children, and community groups. The targets rarely, if any, if ever, notice that they're being manipulated. If they do suspect what's happening, they generally don't know how to shut the process down. Suppose a desired policy uh, is no failing grades, and suppose that policy is placed on the table. The provocateur utilizes a selective hearing process so that only those questions that support no failing grades will be placed on the table for discussion. The only opposing arguments permitted will be those that the provocateur deems helpful in escalating tensions later on. So if you have an opposing view and you know that's not the preferred view, 
don't be taken in by the fact that this so-called facilitator acknowledges your suggestion. Remain on your guard. The provocateur, acting as moderator, guides the discussion so that it doesn't get away from him or her. This means that the facilitator operative frames the debate and is careful not to let go. Soon, some participants begin to adopt the no failing grades idea as if it were their own and will be manipulated into pressuring the entire group into accepting that proposition. Basically, the consensus strategies like Delphi are based on Marx's theory of alienation, which states that folks will do just about anything to avoid being ostracized, ridiculed, or to otherwise lose face. What happens is that somewhere in the consensus building process, there's a switch that confuses, numbs, and freezes normal responses. Aware that something's going wrong, but unable to explain or define it, you find yourself tongue-tied. Linguistics professor Dean Gocher, director of the Institute of Authority Research, explains that there appears to be a trigger mechanism that cuts off awareness of impending danger and suppresses the ability to resist, resulting in indecision and eventually capitulation. Between the computer and word of mouth, it's fairly easy for a provocateur to pre-select individuals who are likely to go along with a proposal and thus to pack an audience. Participants against a facilitator desired proposal are frequently included too, but they're screened in order to ensure they will not be particularly articulate or that they will sound shrill in their voice or hysterical or that they have a reputation for being unorganized in their presentations. So I hate to say this, but don't be overly flattered if you're asked to serve on a curriculum committee or a task force. <laughs> the key to resistance, especially in uh, highly charged, well-organized situations, lies in controlling the environment of thought. An environment of thought means determining what a group of individuals is going to think about and for how long. For example, the media has decided that the Michael Jackson fiasco is a hot topic and that it can be made to divert attention from more important subjects. Whoever controls the debate or agenda controls the substance of what's going on, be it a discussion, political issues to be addressed, what news is read on the air and what news is spiked, even what music goes out over the airwaves and what gets no airtime at all. If such control is engineered by an experienced professional in a group setting, a meeting, a focus group, a committee, task force, and so on, no questions will be asked, no views will be aired that deviate from the pre-selected topics. Another tool in the arsenal of prose is the ability to make facts and truths interchangeable. Now think about that. What's the difference between a fact and a truth? Making truths and facts interchangeable involves easing individuals away from thinking about how they personally feel on a topic in the context of their own experience. This is accomplished by placing members of the group into a hypothetical environment, a pretend situation that's essentially foreign to their experience, but which requires their involvement. That is, placing you into a what would you do if situation. And by the way, this is why school tests and questionnaires pose hypothetical what would you do if questions to place the students in an environment that's essentially foreign to their experience, but which requires their involvement to pass the test. Done correctly, each individual in the group, or in the case of a pupil questionnaire, each child will move from traditional or fixed beliefs to a transitional mode of thought in which facts become murky and truth and principle are in conflict. From there, the various views held by, held by the majority can be reworded by the facilitator or teacher for the supposed benefit of the group until opinions a person walked in the door with will become watered down, distorted, and ill-defined. So the facilitator is basically there to sell you something you don't need in the form of a program, a curriculum, an activity, a viewpoint, a proposal, or a process. They are not there to help the community, school, student, or group decide what to do. 
They're there to help you get, help you do what they, or more likely, their employers want you to do. To accomplish that, the professional will attempt to trick the group into believing that the program, curriculum, or activity or process was your idea. From there, the group will be manipulated so that folks who are still saying to themselves subconsciously, wait a minute, this isn't my idea, are either convinced to change sides or are overwhelmed by the other members of the group. Your job is to force the facilitator, the provocateur, to expose his or her agenda as early on as possible before he gets you to define yours. Okay, so what do we have to do to counteract somebody else's psychological environment? First, we have to determine what the real issue is. You may, for example, find advertised ahead of time some theme for a meeting, which later turns out to be quite different from what you thought it was going to be. Once you get there, everyone will be encouraged to make lists and talk and so on, because then you can't think straight. The goal is to feel out the group, get a handle on where everyone's coming from. So the thing to do is stay quiet for a while. Thus, rule number two, don't give the provocateur anything to work with until you know why you're there. After you've determined the real issue and committed to keeping yourself quiet, you ask, what is my basic position on this issue? Remember it, and that's rule number three, establishing your thesis or your real opinion and not to let go of it. Other people, of course, will have the opposite view. Remember, what the provocateur wants is a synthesis of two opposing positions, which will be termed a compromise, but it won't be. It will be whatever position the provocateur's boss wants it to be. Okay, let's take a proposal to get to sex education, uh, a, a program for sex education implemented into first grade. What's the first thing you do? People, what's the first thing you do? You determine the issue. Will the issue, the group's reason for meeting, uh, be worded as a new sex education program? No, probably not. They won't tell you that. It will be presented as the problem of AIDS or teen pregnancy or youngster sexual activity. This is what is meant by use of deception. Nobody actually lies, they just withhold the truth and allow you to make mistaken assumptions. So before you go to a meeting, find out who the presenters are going to be, who are the vested interests, that is, who stands to benefit financially from this meeting. Is it the World Resources Institute, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Sierra Club, the World Wildlife Fund? Who? Is there a specific program they may be trying to sell you? Now, the school district, in this case, on the sex education program, may come up with an abstinence program. So you don't want to jump to conclusions, but even if that is on the table, you can be relatively sure that the audience is packed perhaps with people from Planned Parenthood, to ensure that this program is never adopted. So your problem will remain exactly the same, to determine the real issue and decide your position about it. All right, suppose your position is sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong. What's the antithesis, the opposite of this particular uh, idea? Now toward what synthesis Will the facilitator likely try to move the group or community before any mention of this sex education program to be launched at your school? The desired compromise position will probably go something like this. Since teen sexual activity is unavoidable, youngsters who indulge must do so as safely as possible without consequences and without hurting anybody else. Once the provocateur can get everyone in the group to agree to this position, then she can go about garnering support for anything, from AIDS posters for kindergartners to condoms for first graders. It doesn't matter. Anyone who balks will be reminded about the group consensus over and over and over again until most people behave themselves. Some will actually believe the consensus makes sense. Nobody will want to appear stuffy or out of it with the rest of the group. Even though most members may have held the same posi position or thesis you did when they walked in the room. Notice that the counterculture never compromises. 
This is one of the tell-all giveaways that you're dealing with a pro. For example, if the topic is the environment, you'll never hear a word about global warming being just one theory. If the topic is vouchers or tuition tax credits, you'll never hear a word from the facilitator about working together with homeschoolers. Consensus in the context we're discussing it is always a one-way street. Traditionalists like you will do all the compromising, meaning you'll be railroaded into giving in. The key to the facilitator's success, then, is controlling the environment of thought, holding on to the reins of the discussion. Your task is not to let that happen, not at the beginning, not an hour later, not ever. So, how do you control psychological manipulation? Using just the right combination of marketing and agitation results in the ability to manipulate people. If done properly, one can fool most of the people most of the time. Psychological manipulation relies on four key maneuvers. The aim is to legitimize, then institutionalize, unpopular and bogus policies before people know what hit them. The resulting marketing package is not a one-size-fits-all. Rather, different packages are targeted to different elements of society, the business community, the intelligentsia, religious leaders, lawmakers. Take redefining terms. The public misinterprets the terms modifying behavior, targeting attitudes, and outcomes. They think those are good-sounding words. Most of the public assumes that behavior means conduct, that attitude means temperament, that outcomes mean standards. Not so. In the jargon of psychology, modifying behavior means altering beliefs. Attitude means viewpoints. And outcomes means the worldviews a child is supposed to leave school with. A person's attitudes taken together compromise his belief system. People typically are unaware of their belief system as it's made up of unconscious automatic responses to life situations. So the first step in engineering a widespread change of viewpoint is simply to re redefine the terms and to ensure that the new terminology feels good. Slogans help to uh, redefine terms, appealing marketing slogans like smart growth, critical thinking, urban sprawl, are coined by ad agencies paid by special interests to promote and disseminate deceptive buzz terms to various target audiences such as business leaders and to slap those labels on everything that stands still. The same packaging, the same package technique is modified slightly to market ideas to children. How did Britney Spears and Eminem manage to become popular among eight-year-olds who are typically not yet sexually aware? By targeting a market. Targeting a market or proper packaging of a product helps ensure that it can be sold to and accepted by virtually any audience. Just as entertainers who look like prostitutes and pimps and drug addicts are sold to little children, politically charged curriculums are marketed to youngsters in the classroom too, as Michael Chapman showed you so well a few minutes ago. To do it, the advertisers, who in this case are called curriculum developers, must poll, test, and survey the target subjects. That's those polling questions that your kids got that Michael Chapman show showed you, to find out what makes them tick. Then they know how to appeal to their audience or market. Wrong-headed legislation emerges from the fact that policymakers are convinced by professional manipulators that the majority of citizens, or at least the big political contributors, actually favor such initiatives as environmental extremism or graphic sex education. Paid provocateurs representing vested interests generate the phony consensus at deceptive lay meetings that dupe the community members into believing they will have input into the decision-making process when, in fact, the outcome is already assured. Pupils in the classroom are similarly duped via activities, discussion groups, tests, phony tests, surveys, and curricular materials designed not to teach but to deceive by appealing to the children's egos by making them believe their gut reactions are real solutions without reference to any facts or timeless principles. 
Creating and controlling the psychological environment requires the application of three axioms. Repetition, if people hear the same, uh, the same phrases and slogans, long enough they'll come to accept them. They will rarely recall where the ideas originated from. If individuals are isolated, undermined, and embarrassed, and outmaneuvered often enough, they will give up or become so irrational in presenting their views that no one who's not already in their camp will listen. This is also called marginalization and delegitimizing the opposition, but it's in fact isolation. Then there's labeling. If negative labels are applied consistently, both subtly and blatantly, to certain actions, such as faith in God, and certain individuals and organizations, say promise keepers or just fill in the blank, whatever organization you wish, they can, by their very mention, function as negative conditioned responses. Commit these three tenets to memory, repetition, isolation, and labeling. Their successful application produces a populace that values expediency and group approval over independent thought and knocks out all considerations of right or wrong. The target population will actually work to avoid any appearance of individualism for fear of being seen a maverick in the eyes of the group. This goes a long way in quashing dissent. The goal of life becomes to hide in a social group and to allow organizational leaders to make the tough decisions. Framing the debate is key to climate control. <laughs> That's what I call it. That is, keeping control of the psychological environment. When you frame the debate, you direct or drive the discussion. That is, you deflect, you deflect attention from what the real agenda is. In effect, you tell people what they're going to think about and for how long. Now, I want to focus your attention uh, on the classroom setting for just a moment because raw indoctrination, which is used in the classroom, entails to a large extent framing the debate just like it's used with adults. Just as in the media, they tend to dictate what Americans are going to think about and for how long, like with the Michael Jackson thing and years ago the O.J. Simpson business. Students in today's therapy-style classrooms are encouraged to discuss, read, and engage in activities that support a particular worldview. As soon as the pupil deviates from that worldview, the topic or the activity is changed or ended. Now, this, of course, is the opposite of free expression or open discussion, but that's not how it's labeled. It's labeled academic freedom. But indoctrination, like its sister brainwashing, is a more sophisticated form of psychological manipulation. It goes beyond framing the debate because its purpose is not merely to redirect attention or disrupt the thought process, but to systematically root out a person's support system, their emotional support system. This is something that not only you and as an adult must train yourself to recognize and combat, but you must teach your children to do it as well. There are five basic steps to indoctrination. You sweep away the subject's support base, that's his or her emotional life raft. Undermining parents is a favorite technique, a way of yanking the rug out from under the kids. Bombard the subject senses with a steady diet of conflicting, confusing images and words in order to impair rational thought and discourage reflection, that's cognition. The technical term for this is, as I showed you in a previous slide there, was thought disruption. The result is a vacuum where the belief system used to be. Once a vacuum has been created, leaving the subject vulnerable and impressionable, and the technical term is willing to receive stimuli, you lead the subject to the desired ideas, concepts, and beliefs via trained intermediaries, that's facilitators and so forth, the clinicians, change agents, agitators. And then, after that, you condition the subject through repeated exposure to the desired beliefs using a wide variety of formats and activities. You repeat the lies, in other words, until the subject believes them. Then you test, survey, or analyze the market figures to ascertain whether the new beliefs have been internalized, as they call it, and accepted. If not, you recycle the subject. You go through the whole thing again. Indoctrination depends 
on the intermediary, say a teacher trained as a change agent, appearing value neutral even though the materials and the agenda are not. Thus does the new breed of teacher, also called a coach clinician or facilitator, avoid lectures, rote drills, workbooks, because instruction, as per the technical definition you and I grew up with, isn't desired anymore. Knowledge imparted in a systematic manner is not the point of the exercise. Rather, the idea is to interpose, smuggle in, as it were, certain impressions, notions, attitudes, judgments, and conclusions into that vacuum created by stripping the belief system and impairing rational thought. In this way, viewpoints that might have been rejected by the subject out of hand will suddenly appear plausible. This means the target population must experience repeated exposure to the same desirable beliefs using a wide variety of formats and activities. Let's take the acceptance of homosexuality. Now, this can be promoted, is promoted, in a variety of ways. For example, one, by offering a new Barbie doll spin-off called the Gay Billy Doll. You may have seen it. Another way is to working with producers to ensure that a wide variety of popular TV programs have gay and lesbian actors and plot lines or handing out pro-homosexual literature to youngsters as they enter or leave elementary schools, or just keeping the topic of homosexuality always in the news with simple, uh, sympathetic articles in magazines, you know, gay marriage, hate crimes, gay parades, and so on. And then there's launching non-stop ads and billboard campaigns, usually under the cover of AIDS awareness. In a school setting, Conditioning would entail an interdisciplinary approach to learning so that the topic is inserted into all curricular areas like Michael Chapman showed you uh, in the fuzzy math thing. You, you, you put it in, you intersperse it everywhere you possibly can. You slap the message on everything that stands still. The same approach is applied to promote gun control, global warming theory, or smart growth. Same thing. One reason our side has fared so poorly is that we have failed to utilize the multidisciplinary approach to advancing our views. In Washington, D.C., where I am, for example, we have no billboards on the highway or in the subway stations like our opposition does. In Hollywood, there's little effort to recruit good script writers and lobby producers, even though there are some there that would be ripe for the uh, lobbying if you were to do so. In Detroit, no one is at the elementary schools checking for people illicitly handing out gay literature. In New York, there's no massive effort to buy up or to take over existing media outlets, even though you could do so. When we do form new media outlets, we label ourselves conservatives or religious so that our opposition doesn't have to do it for us. They never call themselves the leftist television network. Okay, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. The final phase of indoctrination is always testing. And there's a little spin on that. To be sure the desirable new ideas and beliefs are internalized and accepted by the public. In the case of, say, homosexual tolerance or even just sexual freedom, promiscuity, for example, experts would look at the sales figures for the gay billy dolls. That's a test. And that Austin Powers doll that squawks, are you horny, baby, at the child who picks it up off the shelf. The sales figures function as a test. If the test results are disappointing, it's time to recycle, usually using a uh, more hard-hitting approach and going through the whole five-step indoctrination process again. Eventually, resistance to sex-filled entertainment starts to sound silly. If the Austin Powers doll that squawks, are you horny baby, is deemed funny by most parents instead of gross, then that's success. The reason the method works is that various marketing campaigns or lessons, uh, if you will, bypass the conscious intellectual mind and shoot directly for the more vulnerable subconscious. It goes right for the gut. So how do you help kids avoid groupthink? Not only do you have to deal in meetings and on committees and you know, with these specific attack strategies used against you by professional manipulators, you have to teach your children the pitfalls of misleading rhetoric. That, that is, you have to explain, and frequently, how words can be put together to deceive them. 
In this age of Oprah, for example, you'll have to explain what privacy means. They don't know. <laughs> I mean, it used to be that if someone came into your house and asked how much did you pay for your couch, that would have been insulting. You'd have thought that was private. Not anymore. The child cannot possibly be expected to know what's inappropriate if you don't explain it to him. So, at the beginning of this session, I alluded to the principles of psych war. The most fundamental precept, which again goes all the way back to the days of Confucius, is all warfare is based on deception. This means every kind of war, not just some wars. Thus we see that as early as 500 BC, philosophers understood that success in war, be it armed or psychological, depends on the ability to confuse and delude while concealing one's true character, weaknesses, strong points, and intentions. Let me say right up front here, this is not lying as in bearing false witness against one's neighbor. This refers to your personal demeanor, the way you conduct yourself, not to something that you state or write down about somebody else. For example, always let your opponent believe that an escape route is open so they will flee, showing that there's a road to safety, an alternative to losing all, then strike. That's from that little book, The Art of War. Let's consider this allusion to an escape route here. Our opponents have always given us an escape route, what do we escape to? Legitimacy, acceptance. What's the price? Capitulation on the issues that are more important to our adversaries. The road to safety is usually enticing bait that will distract you from the larger issue that is important to your opposition. The Democrats used the phony budget agreement in 1999, which allowed Republicans to save face with the public by claiming victory. But once they seized this route, they were attacked from another direction. An enemy may be, more con may be conquered more easily if the appropriate conditions have been created. What are the conditions? People, what are the conditions that you create? Framing the debate and controlling the psychological environment. Recruit persons who are highly intelligent but who can appear to be stupid who may seem to be dull, but in reality are strong, who are vigorous and energetic, but can appear to weary easily, who are well-versed in earthy matters and able to endure great humiliation in order to succeed. This axiom is absolutely crucial to success. You have to learn to play the game, then turn the tables. And I must say that Mrs. Davis is one of the best people I've ever seen to intuitively understand this principle in talking to her. Uh, it's obvious that she understands this requirement, but you know, all of us have to do that. And the other thing we have to do is not to gobble preferred baits. Our opposition throws us a bone every once in a while on some favorite issue, and in the process saps our energy and diverts our attention from still other issues. Too often we take the bait without a quibble, for example, the bait of environmental conservation, as Michael Shaw uh, pointed out uh, in the first presentation. Weary your opponents by keeping them constantly occupied. Make them rush about, offering them ostensible advantages. How many times does this have to happen to us before we get the message? Our adversaries have taken our strengths, such as time-tested moral virtues, and made them into weaknesses, something everyone's supposed to laugh at on TV while utilizing our weaknesses in organizational know-how and strategy against us. The, con the conservation issue is a perfect example. We're kept so occupied with the rights of bugs and fish that we've nearly forgotten about the rights of humans. So get it into your heads that our enemies don't care about such things as uh, unborn children or the safety of animals and mothers, one way or the other. But if the issue keeps us busy, that's often good news for them. If you don't believe it, go back and study the chronology of the environmental debate and say the abortion debate and then juxtapose the various wins and losses we have had on other issues around the same time in the House and Senate. Another example is race. We're so constantly confronted with articles and news concerning ra racial tensions that hardly anybody remembers the dream of a colorblind melting pot society. Those skilled at making an opponent uh, at, at, you know, those skilled at making an opponent move 
do so by creating some situation to which he must conform. For example, by enticing him with something he's sure to, bait, to take. That's sort of like not taking the bait, but not exactly. This is what the opposition has done with declining test scores. By creating a situation in which academic scores are sure to decline, and Michael Chapman explained how that was done, of course the, the scores in uh, math, hard math, science, and so on are going to decline. Then we were enticed to take the bait of school reform and standards. From there, it's a short jump to restructuring schools, ostensibly to improve test results. Unfortunately, both the standards and the reform have been largely bogus. The terms redefined. Now, here's a good one. Do not demand accomplishment of those who have no talent. Uh, I almost hesitated to add this one, but hey, Sun Tzu put it in there, 500 BC. Now, I know that sounds laughable and obvious, but it's not. For example, most staff advisors on education for members of Congress have no particular expertise in that field or for that matter, any knowledge concerning the major players and vested interests in education. Worse, the position tends to be viewed by them as a stepping stone for political science majors barely out of college onto something a little more exciting. Many such staffers are the sons and daughters of important somebodies in government and are not exactly what you'd call quick studies. The extent of the staffer's knowledge about education is something along the lines of John Dewey being a saint who modernized uh, the schools, think progressive education, and that the leftist extremist lobbying union, the National Education Association, actually looks out for teachers and kids. By the way, who can tell me, this is a test, I'm an old school teacher so I have to do this, who can tell me what psych war rule that we've gone over the expression progressive education comes under? Yes? Uh, what is progressive education? What expression does that? Rem what is that? It's a slogan. Remember slogans, and so that helps them. By the way, let's see. Um, most experienced and talented persons should hold these positions uh, on uh, staff research advisory positions. We should be paying them big bucks, even if it's a low-profile position, because. That tells them that it's valued even though it's low profile. Our adversaries, our opponents have always known this and that's why they have held the advantage. They pay their staff advisors big bucks. Those skilled in war bring the opponent to the field at battle. They do not allow themselves to be taken or drawn there. Why do we always wind up debating issues on our adversaries' turf? When we go to meetings, it's at a time and place of the opposition's choosing. For example, when we debate in a public forum, it's frequently the big three TV networks that get us there. And then guess whose agenda gets the positive coverage? The media hype, of course, is the bait, and we take it. What would happen, for example, if we invited our enviro extremists and smart growth adversaries to debate our side right here today on this turf? They'd just blow us off. Disrupt the opponent's alliances using deceptive operations. Be seen uh, in the west and march out of the east. Lure your enemy to the north and strike in the south. Drive the opposition leaders crazy. He repeats it again. Bewilder them so that their constituencies disperse in confusion. We've already talked about how the counterculture left drives us crazy with its double standards and hypocrisy. What we haven't discussed is the element of surprise luring one's enemy to the north and striking in the south. This means using that element of surprise, for example, by appearing to capitulate on some issues when really buying time to snatch a bigger prize. School privatization schemes like charter schools and vouchers, for example, will in the long run inject additional federal dollars into the school systems, along with the leftist strings that no doubt will be attached. But while we're taking this bait, more red tape and bureaucratic nonsense is piled on to the process of launching a private school, thus driving up the prices. In other words, the left throws us a bone to deflect attention from what they're really up to. Numbers alone confer little advantage. Our opposition has been masters of the numbers game. 
selecting the time and places for confrontation, packing audiences and committees so they can count on their numbers being greater than ours, but, you know, looking around this room, yeah, true, we don't have a lot of people, but, you know, Jesus understood the principle of this principle better than our opposition does. He had only 12 disciples, and they changed the whole world. Avoid the opposition when his spirit is keen and attack him when it's sluggish. This is control of the morale factor. Why do you suppose most school-related meetings are held in the evenings? And it's probably true of the smart growth and all of the others too. True, most people work during the day, but hey, so do the provocateurs. Remember, provocateurs know you'll be more sluggish in the evenings. So rest up. When a faction's leaders or policies are inconsistent, one can bet that spirits are low and the rank and file angry. When people belonging to a faction continually gather in small groups and whisper, the leaders have lost confidence in their constituents. Isn't this amazing? 500 BC. Our adversaries are ever looking for signs of dissension and confusion in our ranks. So care must be taken to avoid showing inconsistency because friction receives huge play in the liberal dominated press and is used against us. Okay, the way in which the mind goes about drawing conclusions is based upon established patterns of logic. This is important if you want to avoid falling victim to thought disruption, which we talked about earlier. Thought disruption is the inability to sustain a line of reasoning from beginning to conclusion. Sometimes the cause is continuous interruptions. The interruptions built into the typical school day have played a huge part in children's inability to concentrate. Later, this has taken formalities like attention deficit disorder. The only deficit is the one the schools are creating by cutting out the learning time. But there's another cause for thought disruption. Most people argue in such a way as to make their case appear more strong than it really is. Thought disruption distracts the listener, and eventually we may forget what we're even talking about. And that's why I said, remember your position on an issue. Now, this issue comprises a large part of my five to eight hour course. Among the methods of distracting participants in a meeting and or deceptively augmenting one's positions are uh, leaving out part of a quotation, misquoting somebody, dismissing the alternatives, changing the subject, that's a favorite, uh, exaggerating the facts, appealing to, uh, appealing to popularity, or smearing the opponents. Lay audiences today are not expected to be able to pick up on faulty reasoning as long as it's smuggled in. A fallacy of logic is a deceptive maneuver intended to bolster an argument. There are, of course, many fallacies, and uh, the ones I focus on in my seminars are the ones parents and other citizens are most likely to encounter on a rigged uh, task force or some kind of committee. And these are some of them that you will see. I'm not going to go into each one because we don't have time, but that's the kind of thing that I focus on in the longer uh, it's in my manual in the back, and I do say quite a bit on it there. But you need to keep in mind that this is the way they bolster an argument many times. I'll give you a chance to look at that for just a second. There are other techniques too, such as the Tavistock and Olinsky techniques, which again I don't have time to go into. Then there's the dead giveaway phrases that should signal you that you're dealing with a professional. Uh, they always start something with a particular lead-in, and there's, I list those lead-in phrases that uh, as soon as you hear that, a red flag should go up in your head that you're dealing with a pro. But for now, let's summarize the basics of what I've covered here. Know when you're under attack. If you can't spot verbal aggression when you hear it, you'll be a perfect target. Do not assume you're oversensitive, paranoid, reactionary, narrow, or that you just don't get it. If something doesn't sound right, there's probably a reason. Know what kind of attack is being employed against you, and that goes back to those, uh, that list that I just gave you. Learn to identify some of the basic structures of fallacious reasoning. Learn to gauge the skill of your adversary and other participants. Make your defense appropriate to the, the attack. 
Remember that a stock response is not necessarily the right one to use. Frequently, the best defense is a good offense. I'll say almost always the best defense is a good offense. When targeted, always question the opponent's basic assumptions rather than taking the bait. Nail him right there. And finally, play through, follow through, play to win. Don't feel guilty about fighting back. Political indoctrination or American constitutionalist? UN's international human rights or the US's inalienable rights? Private property does not lead to tyranny. Government control of property does. You play to win. You keep those thoughts in your mind when you're at these meetings. And remember to follow through on that and never let it go. Thank you very much. I have done my job way too well today, assembling the most powerful speakers on these subjects in this country. And they have given you a, an awful lot of information. And now I have to follow them all. <laughs> so let me take this role. Let me kind of homogenize a lot of what you've heard, sum it up, uh, put it in some very straightforward language so that you can take it home and uh, know what to do with it. Let me just say this. Property, liberty, and the rule of law. These are the founding principles of the United States of America. And we hear these words, yet many Americans fail to understand their meaning or how they affect our everyday lives. Our founding fathers warned us that eternal vigilance was necessary in order to protect our liberties. They have been ignored. And American life has begun to change. Americans are finding that life is getting harder. There's less optimism about the future, as the phrase American dream seems to have disappeared from our vocabulary. There is disharmony in almost every aspect of our lives. Parents worry about an education system that no longer seems to teach basic academics. We find fewer local elected officials listening or serving their constituents. Rules and regulations seem to pop out of nowhere to control our daily routines. And the American dream is crumbling under the weight of it. You see, the American dream is built on opt optimism. It is the idea that you can accomplish anything <clears throat> that you put your mind to. It is the promise that in America you have the freedom to pursue your own goals and that government will protect your right to do it. That is the definition of true freedom. But such a dream can't survive if government is not forced to keep that promise. Instead, government is being used to force an, us into a national submissiveness. The truth is our lives are getting more stressful and every day, our everyday living is getting harder because a revolution is taking place in this country and it is stealing the American promise of inalienable rights. These are the rights we were born with. Rights our founding fathers said were government's duty to protect and preserve. And those natural rights are now being replaced with granted rights created by and authorized by government. As a result, our laws have become little more than rubber bands, stretched to the advantage of the few who have gained the power of pull in a new society of a controlled America. You will find this revolution oozing out of every corner of our society, from textbooks to television to government policy. It is for implementation of this revolution that your schools have been transformed to produce the citizens to live in the new revolutionary society. This is the key to all of the outrages you have witnessed in public classrooms. It is the root to the drive away from academics and sound science. It is the reason why every classroom is filled with discussions of diversity and multiculturalism, but not academics. It is the reason children are being indoctrinated to turn away from their parents and the values that you have taught them. 
They are being prepared to live in a different society than ours. They are not being prepared to be American citizens, but of a global village. That's why they don't need to know about American history and the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, for you see, they are now irrelevant. The education system today is simply an assault on your child's attitudes, values, and beliefs. It is designed to change and mold them. That is public education's only purpose. And if you fail to grasp this fact, you can never succeed in changing it. The revolution is anti-property rights, anti-free enterprise, and anti-liberty. It is anti-national sovereignty and anti-national borders. It is anti-Western culture. The goal of the revolution is to transform the world into feudal-like governance by making nature the central organizing principle for our economy and our society. This is what the leaders of the revolution believe. Quote, Nature has an integral set of different values, cultural, spiritual, and material, where humans are one strand in nature's web, and all living creatures are considered equal. Therefore, the natural way is the right way, and human activities should be molded along nature's rhythms." End quote. That quote comes from the UN's Biodiversity Treaty. An international agenda has been set in motion, beginning with the United Nations treaties and agreements, including the Biodiversity Treaty and Agenda 21. That agenda is now working its way down through federal to state to local governments under current policy. And local, local government is where the current battleground is. The international agenda is driven by the United Nations through two specific UN organizations, including the United Nations Environmental Program and the International uh, Union of Conservation and Nature. And would it surprise you to learn that six different agencies of the United States government are active members of the International Union of Conservation and Nature, including the Department of State, Interior, Agriculture, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And these agencies send representatives to all the meetings of the UN Environmental Program. Through all of the treaties and the agreements and the meetings, there grows an interlocking web of policy that takes root in America through these, these federal agencies even driving down into the state and now into the local community governments. And it doesn't need new legislation from Congress to implement it. The treaties are the root of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. For Congress to back out of these laws or even to consider reducing some of the re resolution or the restrictions that are destroying industry or private property rights would simply be putting the United States in violation of these UN treaties. And our elected leaders have shown that they lack the strength of character to stand up for American interests over all controlling international communities. Agenda 21 is the United Nations blueprint for the complete restructuring of nations and local communities to fit into a proper mold for global governance. Agenda 21 outlines in detail the UN's vision for a completely managed society dictating the process to be used for industry, agriculture, housing development, and education. It is an all-encompassing plan to rule from an all-powerful central government. The common name for the policy is, as you have learned, sustainable development. Sustainable development. If you remember nothing else you've heard here today, remember those two words, sustainable development. And remember this. If you love America's precious liberties, then sustainable development is your enemy. Sustainable development operates on a set of values contrary to the ideals and intentions of the Founding Fathers. And now, under sustainable development, nature takes precedence over man, and non-elected council members decide what we can and cannot do. In our once free society, there are now government debates over the type of car you should be allowed to drive, the kind of foods you may eat, if and when you may build a home or a business. 
Whole industries are being destroyed through so-called environmental uh, protections. Ranchers, farmers, miners, and the timber industry are teetering on the brink of extinction. Government agents from the Benevolent Park Service to the Forest Service to the Army Corps of Engineers are armed like paramilitary SWAT teams to take land from Americans who have worked it for generations. In towns and cities across the nation, homeowners suddenly face jail for cutting trees down on their own property. We now call the trees in your backyard the urban forest. And government now values those trees more than the infrastructure of your community, more than the sewers and the roads, more than the office buildings which house commerce, more than your home which protects your family. Under these new rules, cutting down a tree diminishes the value of the community. That's why homeowners are forced to give up major portions of their property for bike trails and open space to be used by people they don't even know. No trespassing, private property, or ideas from a bygone era. Government can do as it wishes on or to your property. All of these policies stem from the revolution called sustainable development. Ignore sustainable development at the peril of everything you hold dear. Individual liberty, private property, free enterprise, free travel, free association, even life itself. Driving the implementation of sustainable development in the United States are two separate action plans. The first is the Wildlands Project. The Wildlands Project is the most radical, outrageous idea ever conceived by grown men and women. It is the whining rant of spoiled brats who just want to have it their way. They don't like our free society, so they have conceived of a plan to make it disappear. The Wildlands Project calls for the rewilding of 50% of all the land in every state, restoring everything back to the way it was before Christopher Columbus stepped foot on this continent. In other words, the elimination of human presence on over 50% of the American landscape. It was conceived in the minds of eco-thugs like Dave Foreman, the maniac who founded Earth First. In the Wildlands Project documents, Foreman says, quote, We live to see the day when grizzlies in Mexico have an unbroken connection to grizzlies in Alaska, when gray wolf populations are continuous from New Mexico to Greenland, when vast unbroken forests and flowing plains again thrive and support pre-Columbian populations of plants and animals, end quote. In such a vision, there is little room for people. Earth first went on to say, ask this question, does, it all, does all this mean that the Wildlands Project advocates the end of industrial civilization? Most assuredly, end quote. And followers of Foreman's ideas now burn down housing construction sites, destroy heavy equipment owned by timber companies, and set fire to Hummer dealerships. The ballot box apparently is too slow for implementation of their agenda. Reed Noss, one of the authors of the Wildlands Project and later a policy expert of the Clinton Department of Ed Interior, said, quote, the native ecosystems and the collective needs of non-humans species must take precedence over the needs and desires of humans. The project became a threat to you and me and the rest of the world when the Wildlands Project, the blueprint for it, was included in the UN's Biodiversity Treaty and was ratified at the UN's 1992 Earth Summit. In other words, the Wildlands Project quickly grew from the ravings of lunatics to international policy. And of course, that wasn't an accident. The eco-thugs have a direct link to the UN as recognized non-governmental organizations. They actually help write the policies. Much of the Biodiversity Treaty was implemented by the Clinton administration through executive order, even though it was never officially ratified by the Senate, thanks to Michael Kaufman. It's now official U.S. government policy. Now, the second path of implementing sustainable development is smart growth, as Michael talked about. This is a plan to herd all of us into specific human habitat areas, out of the suburbs and our beautiful yards, and into crowded cities and high-rises. And high 
The entire plan was introduced at the 1996 UN Habitat II uh, Summit in Istanbul, and in the back of the room I've got an original document, uh, a draft copy of what uh, our own agency, Housing and Urban Development, presented at HUD, I mean presented at the uh, Istanbul conference. That plan calls for the downsizing of cities and towns into new urban clusters where workplaces, housing, and nature are blended together. Homes and communities set up in specific human habitat areas will be crowded, multifamily, low-rise residential areas with running and walking paths instead of cars. Transportation will be primarily light rail trains and bicycles, as you've heard. As one smart growth activist gleefully said, quote, it will be the humans in cages with the animals looking in. Under the Sustainable Development Banner, the battle to diminish the liberty that our founding fathers provided is accelerating. You know, America is different from any nation on earth. We are wealthy beyond the comprehension of any society before us. We are strong, powerful, and healthy. For 200 years we have prospered because we have operated under a rule of law that was designed to protect the individual's right to pursue his own life in the way he chooses to work, to play, to invest, and to own property and use it in a way that best suits our needs. The government, by edict of the Constitution, has the responsibility to protect such activities. This nation is the only one in the history of the world in which the Founding Fathers set out to find a style of government that would guarantee protection of individual rights and property rights. Nearly every other nation began as a dictatorship or the subject of a king. Most nations of the world still operate that way. The property in, the, in those nations began as the personal property of the king or the government. Those who were granted ownership occupied it at the pleasure of the government and at the peril of losing it back to that same power whenever it wanted the land. Not so in the United States of America. In this nation, from the very beginning, private ownership of the land was undertaken as a right of the people. Government's job was to make sure that no one could take, unjustly take that land, or control how it was used, or trespass over it against the owner's will. Such a form of government is not a democracy. Democracy. The idea that the majority rules can be a lynch mob crying for action against an individual it has deemed guilty. If the law says we must first try him, the lynch mob cries, we can't wait for the slow wheels of justice to turn. Somebody must do something now. Democracy is three wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for lunch. And the democracy, democracy is the word most used to describe the implementation of sustainable development. Our way of government is a republic. In a republic, even if the majority dislikes how a property owner uses the land, the government protects his right to do so, so long as he's not infringing on the same rights of others. Too bad if he's got four cars parked in the, in the driveway, one of them's on jacks, or decides to paint the house purple with a green door, the land is his. It's bought and paid for. The founding father, particularly James Madison, took these ideas to heart and put them in the Constitution, particularly in the Fifth Amendment. It limits government taking of private property, saying no American shall, quote, be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This is a guarantee to Americans that they are safe and free to pursue their own lives without interference of government. In fact, it says the government's job is to protect those liberties so that they can pursue their own lives. Without that guarantee, there can be no society. Chaos and tyranny would replace order and prosperity. And that guarantee is only possible in a republic. Guaranteed by those protections, Americans began to work their land. With their free minds, they invented new approaches and created new jobs and found new ways to prosper. As a result, our standard of living improved. Science improved our health care. Life expectancy increased. 
and wealth followed. Americans began to carve an incredible society out of the, uh, the barren wilderness. In just, a few, in just a few short years, we've surpassed ancient cultures. America became the envy of the world because Americans were free individuals, able to choose their own way of life, able to pursue their own dreams like nowhere else on earth. Ideas mattered. Difference of opinion and the right to express it was an important part of our freedom. All possible because of the right to own and protect private property. Such visions of freedom have become our legacy. Today, as we are attacked by running dog terrorists, the nation rallies around the mantra of freedom. Flags fly from our homes and our car antennas. Bumper stickers declare, God bless America. Banners shout, let freedom ring. But in fact, under the banner of diversity, community, and earth, our American liberty is being replaced with rights granted by a gang of anti-American hooligans hiding out in the United Nations and buried in government bureaucracies and non-governmental private organizations. It is the lynch mob in action. As a result, the American people and their every action are being ruled, regulated, licensed, restricted, registered, directed, checked, inspected, measured, numbered, counted, rated, stamped, censored, authorized, admonished, refused, prevented, drilled, indoctrinated, monopolized, extorted, robbed, hoaxed, fined, harassed, disarmed, dishonored, fleeced, exploited, assessed, and taxed to the point of suffocation and desperation. James Madison said private property ownership, quote, embraces everything to which man may attach value and have a right. Step by step, we are eliminating property rights in America, and that means we are eliminating freedom. John Adams said, quote, the moment the idea is admitted into society that property is not as sacred as the laws of God, and there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it, Anarchy and tyranny commence. Is that not what we have done? Do we want leaders who stand for the rule of law, or do we select candidates based on which ones uh, promise to give out the best goodies? The truth is we keep electing politicians who offer the best argument on how to use government power. We select our leaders today based on which ones have the best plan for collecting taxes, the best plan for restricting land use, the best plan for providing government-restricted medical care and drug prescriptions, and soon, if some get their way, the best plan to control what we eat. You know, obesity, you see, it's a new sustainable mantra. In every case, by electing people like this, we are licensing the government to infringe on someone else's property rights. As a result, Americans are now beginning to wake up to find the real 800-pound gorilla, sustainable development, living on their property. So how do we describe sustainable development? We've heard a lot of discussion about it today, but try this one. Imagine an America in which a specific ruling principle is created to decide proper societal conduct for every citizen. Let me say that again. Imagine an America in which a specific ruling principle is created to decide proper societal conduct for every citizen. That principle would be used to control everything you eat, what you wear, the kind of home you live in, the way you get to work, the way you dispose of waste, the number of children you may have, even your education and employment decisions. Sustainable development is that ruling principle for the implementation of what former Vice President Al Gore said we must all suffer through in order to purify our nation from the horrors of the 20th century's Industrial Revolution. In his book, Earth and the Balance, Gore called it a wrenching transformation of society. Consequently, sustainable development calls for changing the very infrastructure of the nation away from private ownership and and control of property to nothing short of a national zoning system. In such a system, 
The federal government is backed by an army of private, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, like the Sierra Club, Planned Parenthood, the National Education Association, the National Governors Association, the Association of State Legislatures, the National Mayors Association, and the National Association of County Commissioners, to name a very, very few. These non-elected groups influence, if not dictate, policy in state government and in local communities. Locally elected officials are no longer the single driving force in making decisions for their communities. Most is done behind the scenes in non-elected sustainability councils armed with truckloads of federal regulations and guidelines and grant money. In the report from the President's Council on Sustainable Development, terms such as harness market forces describe proposals to impose consumption taxes on products that management, not government, management deemed to be unsustainable. So you've heard of proposals for fat taxes on sodas and McDonald's. According to sustainable development principles, Air conditioning, convenience food, single-family housing, and cars are all among the products that have already been determined to be unsustainable. Add to that ski runs, grazing of livestock, plowing fields, logging, dams and reservoirs, and power line construction, as outlined in the Biodiversity Treaty, and you get the full picture of America under sustainable development. The logo used in sustainable development literature depicts three concentric circles, each labeled with a defining category of the ruling principle. One is labeled social equity, another economic prosperity, and the third ecological integrity, as you've seen. Well, they sound innocent enough. But these three categories encompass every aspect of human life. To achieve the goals behind those very basic items would determine, would demand unlimited government authority, to control business decisions, eliminate private property and personal achievement, and create a completely managed society under top-down bureaucratic control. Social equity and social justice require that the Earth's wealth be shared between those who produce and those who do not. It's every welfare program and wealth redistribution scheme ever uh, proposed. This is not free choice by individuals. Under sustainable development, business is little more than a tool of the social planning managers. Partnerships between business and government decide what kinds of products are to be produced, who will produce them, and how they will be produced. All must be done in accordance with environmentally correct procedures, i.e. government regulations. Taxes to force compliance will ensure proper business conduct. This is not free enterprise and ecological integrity. Well, that's just the excuse the social planners use to sucker you and me in and enforce their timeless schemes for power. Under sustainable development, true environmental protection is just for the suckers. Power and wealth redistribution is the real game being played here. In the name of protecting the environment, in the name of social equity and justice, in the name of safety and prosperity, sustainable development has become official policy in the federal government through and state government and every large city and burg in this country. Those behind it are powerful, well-funded, well-placed, and well-organized. No matter how many, how crazy their plan, they are succeeding in building support with the American people. And here's how. Your community is now a sustainable community. I don't think anyone has any doubt about that. But have you heard your officials talking about how to curtail growth and block development? Are they talking about historic preservation? Is your downtown now called a historic district? Are they talking about how to control business development? Has the subject of public transportation come up? Is it getting more and more difficult to enjoy driving your car around town? Here's the definition of a sustainable community from the President's uh, Council, President's Council on Sustainable Development Report. Quote, sustainable communities encourage people to work together to create healthy communities where natural resources and historic resources are preserved, jobs are available, sprawl is contained, neighborhoods are secure, education is lifelong, transportation and health care are accessible, and all citizens have opportunities to improve the quality of their lives. If only the Founding Fathers had thought of that. So now let's break it all down. How do you actually achieve these goals? 
Again, see if some of these things don't sound familiar. How do the people work together? We need some sort of committee or council to join. Once uh, that uh, one that will set a vision for the city, we need all of the leaders, from elected officials to educators to business leaders to the local chamber of commerce to the local news media. They will put a plan together for the future development of the community. And by the way, the plan isn't really written by this committee. The blueprint comes out of Washington, D.C., back with federal grants for anybody who will comply. <clears throat> now, to see that the committee can really achieve its goals, it needs to have some teeth. We need a partnership between the committee and government. A plan will be drawn up, and it will be the guideline for laws and regulations. Now, to give our plan the appearance that it is legitimately uh, accepted by the community, we will hold some uh, series of public meetings and give it a uh, general overview of how of what we want to do, and all we want to do is make the community a better place. Of course, no votes will be taken. There will be no debates. Dissenters must be silenced. That would be divisive to our good works. It's important that we hire a professionally trained facilitator who will guide our citizens to the proper outcome. A community consensus is important to our plan. So what kind of important decisions will be uh, in that plan for the good of us all? The key to the plan is smart growth. So the committee must uh, control the use of all private property. It must decide what is historic and must be preserved. It must set boundaries beyond which no new homes may be built. It must decide how the community should look, where our open space should be, where businesses could be allowed to operate. Farmers must be stopped from selling their land to developers, even if our economic policies make it impossible to earn a living on the farm. We'll just take taxpayer dollars and give it to the farmers to buy out their development rights. It's commonly known as a PDR. That way, the land will forever be controlled by the government. Now, cars are a very nasty habit. We must teach our community that everyone should be more open to public transportation. We must build light rail trains and bus lines to get us around to our jobs. And to make it convenient for everyone, we'll design housing developments around the rail and bus lines so that they are within walking distance for everyone. We'll surround the community with bike paths and high-density uh, real estate policies that restrict development. We'll narrow streets and refrain from building unnecessary roads. In fact, eventually, our plan calls for eliminating cars from the community, and that will relieve overcrowded streets. Cars will be banned. Our homes can be designed in high and low-rise buildings with office space on top floors and stores on the main floor. With our apartments sandwiched in between, we'll never have to leave the building during our daily routine. So we don't need yards that have to be mowed with smelly, gas-guzzling, air-polluting, noise-polluting moors. We'll just provide parks and other open green space for the people to find, to find recreation. And of course, with our low and high-rise public housing, single-family homes that w waste precious land won't be necessary. Suburban housing will be banned. We'll strictly control the use and development of utilities like power and natural resources like water. Now, you know, people who live in the desert and far-off lands have water shortages. So, to be fair, we must force our citizens to strictly re restrict their water usage. Now, 10 gallons a day, according to the Sierra Club, 10 gallons a day per person seems about right. The committee will actively seek to bring in business to the community to provide jobs for our community, but we only want certain businesses here. We won't accept those who lack the proper environmental attitudes. They will either comply or be banned from operating in our town. And if we don't have enough jobs after all that banning, We'll tax the businesses that are there to raise the necessary funds to help those who don't have a job because social equity is key to our, community's, our committee's plan. Now, people must have homes and medical care and food. It's their right, you understand. It's the duty of those who have money to help those who don't, especially the businesses which are so rich. Now, all of these guidelines were very carefully laid out at the United Nations uh, Habitat II conference in 1996. Communities like Baltimore, Maryland won awards for implementing these policies, so we can follow the same thing. But we must do more. 
The vision can, can't become reality unless the people in the community have the proper respect for the plan. They must have the right attitudes, values, and beliefs in order to support what the good folks on the committee are trying to do for the common good of us all. Our one place to start is in the schools. Here are our future generations. It's not as important that they can read and write and perform math problems as it is that they understand the importance of living together with your neighbors in a happy, prosperous, safe, well-organized community. They can learn the basic academics on their own, but it's vital that they understand our goals. So let's add some classes to help them obtain the proper outlook for the future. Teach them that they must work together rather than selfishly setting personal goals. Teach them that our community will only needs certain kinds of workers to help the program along. Help them select career paths that fit the needs of the community. Help them understand that personal wants and dreams and ambitions are selfish and will only hurt everyone else's future. Now, how can we best teach them these things? Well, businesses know how to organize things like this. Let's form a partnership with business to help the children learn how to work right there in the school. In fact, we can even get, let each child take half a day of school off and go to work on the job as a volunteer. And to make sure that everyone participates will make it part of their grade. And to make sure that they always keep the valuable lessons and don't stray from the special teachings they learned in the school to work partnership, let's keep their education going for life. We'll require that they come back for refresher courses periodically throughout their lives. To protect our sustainable community, we've got to make sure everyone maintains the proper attitudes, values, and beliefs. And to make sure that they do attend the lifelong learning classes, we'll use that partnership with business as an on-the-job incentive. That way, lifelong learning can lead to better jobs and better pay. It's also very organized. And for the adults... There can be public visioning classes for them, too. After all, we can't fully organize the community around our grand idea if there is resistance from some of the people. That will spoil all of our great plans for the health and security of our community. So again, with our business partnerships and with the help of the Chamber of Commerce and the schools, we'll work, out, uh, work with the folks in our, on a neighborhood basis. The United Nations has a program we can use as our guide. Chattanooga, T Tennessee did it. So can we, neighborhood by neighborhood. We'll bring the folks in, teach them how important it is to protect the environment and how evil sprawl can be to our well-laid plans. And once we have helped them obtain the proper attitudes, values, and beliefs, we can set up some lifelong learning classes and business partnerships for adults, too. And we must take care of our elderly and our sick. Doctors must not be so greedy. We'll set up government-sponsored clinics with tax-paid health care so all can afford it. After all, we have a right to demand that government take care of us when we're sick. Doctors will just have to form a partnership of their own with the committee and accept a decent salary. It's all for the public good, you understand. And there are other things that the community will find necessary to ban in order to assure that the citizens have the opportunity to improve their lives. Obesity is a national epidemic. We must also control what people eat. Our plan will make sure that they eat properly. That's why we can't allow precious farmland in our county to be wasted on raising cattle for beef consumption. Beef is harmful to your health, and so it will be banned. Wheat and soy will be grown on the land instead. Ever had a delicious Thanksgiving dinner of tofurkey? <laughs> With our new healthy diet, as outlined by the committee, we will no longer need things like 7-Elevens and McDonald's and their unhealthy fast foods and snacks. They will be banned. And there's one more danger to the happiness and security of our community that must be addressed. Overpopulation. The committee will decide the proper number of folks who can comfortably live in our community's limits. If we don't control the population, we will be overrun. Some strict guidelines must be imposed for the sake of the community's well-being and for the protection of our environment. Birth control education and supplies will be a major part of the process for keeping the population down. But if our folks don't heed the committee's warnings, if the population begins to exceed our limits, drastic action will be required. 
Limits on the number of children a family may have will have to be imposed. Those conceiving children against those limits will have to pay a high price. Fines, of course. Imprisonment for exceptional cases. Now what to do about those yet unborn but illegal babies? Action must be taken for the sake of all of us in the community. Do you understand where we're headed, my friends? Name the issue. Name the aspect of your life that is not affected by such a mentality. All of this and much more is the future under sustainable development. This is not about preserving the environment for future generations. It's indeed a wrenching transformation of America away from a nation of well-protected liberties to one of all controlling regulations. Across the nation, Americans are now facing an assault on their liberties as never before experienced in the land of the free. On the New River in West Virginia, 100 families suddenly found that they were going to lose their homes to the National Park Service. Why? Because the National Park Service had acquired control over the property years ago when the New River had been designated a National Heritage River. Watch out for those designations in those national parks and all the things that go with historic preservation because this is where it's leading to. Citizens along the river hadn't read the fine print of the plan until it was too late. A public meeting was called to announce, not discuss, announce the plan to build a scenic parkway replacing their road they had only hoped to have repaired. They've been trying to get it repaired for 15 years, called the meeting, they thought for sure this was it. And they find out instead it's a scenic parkway. Citizens attending the meeting were met with armed guards at the door. Inside, photographs of their property were displayed on the walls. Some of the photos showed their homes, and some were digitally enhanced to eliminate the homes, showing the future along the New River. No homes, no people. You see, their homes were in the view shed of the new parkway. Some tourists might like to take pictures of the scenic view, and their homes were in the way. And that's the only excuse they needed. When one elderly family asked a park ranger why they were taking the home they had lived in all of their lives, he answered, because we can. In Columbia, South Carolina, the Richland County Council passed a town and country land use vision plan that will restrict forever the use of land by private property owners. Once the land has been tied up, with massive use restrictions, the council set up a conservation commission to begin to acquire the land. Those who finally gave up and surrendered their land were then gleefully called willing sellers. My friend Kay McClanahan, a property owner and courageous fighter for her rights, has organized her neighbors to fight the plan. For her trouble, she and her husband were bodily thrown out of a council meeting even after being recognized by the chairman to speak. Kay almost had her shoulder broken as the barely five-foot-tall lady was pushed out the door by a big burly security cop, and she still wears a sling and a brace. She was only trying to speak to her elected representatives who were, try- who were planning to take her private property. And in Klamath Falls, Oregon, more than 100 farmers are, uh, have been threatened with extinction after environmentalists got a court order to turn off their water to support a sucker fish. Now the folks who worked their private land and turned it into a thriving oasis are dying of thirst. Their farms turned into wasteland. As they suffer the loss of their American dream, power-thirsty environmentalists move in to buy their land and declare them willing sellers. Would you consider willingly selling your land at 25 cents on the dollar after you've spent thousands on legal fees, lost your livelihood, and seen your entire community destroyed for the sake of a sucker fish? Well, neither did the folks of Klamath Falls. And in Falmouth, Maine, in this beautiful property, Mary Alice Davis seeks to develop a few acres of her 187-acre estate for million-dollar homes. But she has been blocked by a community elite who refused to allow her to use her property for any purpose other than her home that already exists. Again, She is told that her property is someone else's view shed and their sunsets take precedent over her economic desires. Such restrictions imposed only on her and the town have basically rendered her land worthless because no one will buy it with such controls attached. 
Because Mary Alice wants to achieve her own American dream and profit from her own property, she has been personally attacked. Even her reputation and morality have been publicly disparaged as she has called outrageous names like gold digger and prostitute and cultist. In fact, Mary Alice was cynically told that anything she wanted to do with her land would basically have to be underground. And that started Mary Alice thinking about the urgent need for the, the community had for a new cemetery. And that's how you fight these people. <laughs> this is how sustainable development is affecting millions of Americans and their private property, their hopes and their dreams. Remember, to rewild 50% of all the land in every state is called for in the Wildlands Project, Americans have to lose a lot of private land. These are just a very few of the victims. The rest of us are next. But what about the courts, you may ask? We have laws in this country. Keep in mind, those who tell you that the United Nations has no control over our nation, that it is no threat to our sovereignty. And then listen to these words from Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Quote, through commerce, through globalization, through the spread of democratic institutions, through immigration to America, it's becoming more and more one world of many different kinds of people. And how they're going to live together across the world will be the challenge. And whether our Constitution and how it fits into the governing documents of other nations, I think, will be the challenge for the next generations. It's our Constitution and how it fits in England and France and Africa. That's the challenge. So much for the rule of American law. Sustainable development is now official policy of the Supreme Court of the United States, too. You worry about bending the Constitution? Under sustainable development, they are just ignoring it. There has never been a single vote in Congress to create sustainable development. It's all done through cleverly rearranging wording of existing programs and budgets, using UN treaties as guidelines. It's all under the radar. Former Secretary, uh, Commerce Secretary Ron Brown told a meeting of the President's Council on Sustainable Development that his agency could implement at least 67% of the sustainable de development agenda assigned to his agency with no new legislation. That's how it's done. And that's why you've never heard a debate on such a radical transformation of our nation. Ronald Reagan once said about communists, quote, the only morality they recognize is what will further their cause, meaning they reserve unto themselves the right to commit any crime, to lie, to cheat. He could have been talking about today's international sustainable development movement. Sustainable development is the greatest threat ever perpetrated against American liberty. There can be no hope of living in a nation of limited government with sustainable development as the official pol government policy. The two are diametrically opposed. Americans would never concede their liberty to swastikas or hammer and sickles, but you tuck it all in a green blanket for environmental protection and we'll toss it all in the fire like a good old-fashioned book burning. This is about totalitarianism. It's about controlling every aspect of our lives with decisions made by committees that will grow more powerful and more oppressive with each passing day and each new regulation proposed by newly empowered special interest groups. There will be no satisfying their lust for power. There will be no part of our lives that is overlooked or control, uncontrolled. Our homes, our food, our babies, our liberty. Group thought. Group plans, group action is how the community will be organized. To defeat it, we must understand that it is free men operating in free markets, untethered by government regulations that allow us to find solutions to hunger, decent housing, superior medical care, education, overcrowded highways, and human happiness. We must understand that it is only bad government that causes poverty, overpopulation, and environmental damage. Totalitarianism, socialism, fascism, and almost every other ism are the root of suffering on earth. The logo of sustainable development with its three concentric circles should be viewed by all who love liberty as the new swastika of our era. There is no greater threat to our way of life. Imagine agents coming to your home with that on their armband and you'll get the picture. 
the sustainable development logo. Sustainable development is anti-science. It is anti-knowledge. It is anti-human. It is anti-reason. In a nutshell, sustainable development is designed to throw out virtually everything that man has learned since the beginning of time. It is the creed of the mindless savage who seeks brute force over reasoned thought. And it won't and if we don't learn of this evil now, if we don't heed the warning, if we don't rip it out of every level of government policy by its well-entrenched roots, then American life, indeed human existence as we know it, will enter a new dark ages of pain and misery unlike any ever experienced by the community of man. Sustainable development is being accepted by Americans across this nation because they are being made to feel afraid. They are afraid of urban sprawl and crowded highways. They fear that their communities will lose their local flavor. So they look for answers through the heavy hand of more government, that same government that causes many of those problems in the first place. And the politicians are playing on that fear to give themselves more power because that too is how sustainable development works. But it's an agenda that ultimately doesn't work. Because government control of individuals is a bankrupt scheme proven a failure time and time again throughout history. And that's why it can be stopped. The key to victory is to first understand your enemy. Know where he is headed and you can cut him off at every turn. Americans must learn now that the promises of sustainable development is a lie to trick them into accepting mass government control of every aspect of their lives. Farmers must learn that selling the rights to their property through PDRs and conservation easements mean they lose control of their land forever. Their true enemy lies in government policies which keep them from earning a living off the land in the first place. More controls won't change their plight. It'll only make it worse. Communities must stop partnerships between private corporations and local governments from using the power of eminent domain to take private homes for their own gain. Under such power, no homes are safe. We are engaged in a battle for the American dream our founding fathers worked hard to guarantee. I feel they're watching us now. They knew one truth that we must all relearn very quickly. The only way to make sure that government doesn't abuse its power is to not grant it in the first place. We must stop sustainable development. Arm yourselves first with that knowledge and then step by step take your community and then take America back. Thank you very much. Better think about taking a stand For they round you up 
up and trade you a cup of kindness for your land. Cause when you're all locked up in cages made from tractors, rakes, and plows, you'll have plenty of time to ask yourselves, who's in danger now? Sustainable development sweeping the countryside from the California coastline. We can see it nationwide. Coming soon to a town near you, biological diversity. Yeah, the eco police got plans for you and your so called liberty. Hey, hey. So let's gather up this rotting mess of collectivist policy and toss it on. Century. Help keep alive the principles of individual liberty and advance the cause of freedom in the 21st century. Hey, hey, hey. E I E I O. <laughs>